Hello everyone, uh, today we will discuss computable philosophy, a proposal um, Len Gien Hong and me made out of our book. Uh, so in this proposal, um, there are three key ideas, is that um, computing judgments and information are more interlinked than people think of them. Uh, the second proposal is that computing and making judgments by programming and setting rules uh, does not scale, so we need to complement them with learning, with inference from observations. So that is like first axis is computation, judgment and information. The second axis is learning, how to, how to infer laws and rules from observations. And the third axis is probabilistic thinking, which we'll see is inevitable if we want to do correct inference and robust inference. Um, those, those three axes are well studied within computer science and, 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 uh, and information science. What we believe is that there, uh, as we discussed in the, in the video on, um, on, uh, on Scott Aronson's paper, is that uh, there are more philosophical aspects to be discussed. In particular, uh, when it comes to questions like AI ethics uh, or, or law itself, uh, if we look at it from an algorithmic perspective, and even the scientific method, from an algorithmic perspective. There are many illustrations we have in the book for why these three tools could help us discuss um, aspects like moral philosophy, uh, the value alignment problem, we want to align the objective function of an AI with, with human preferences, etc. the side effects of algorithmic decision-making, uh, the good heart slow, so what, what happens, what goes wrong when we maximize a metric, um, uh, pre preference and volition learning, how to learn not only what people prefer, but what they would want to prefer if they had more time and, and, and information. Social choice theory, which was uh, researched by game theory and economics in the past century, but th that is increasingly important in algorithmic decision making and aggregation of preferences between many users. Uh, adversarial computing, decentralization also is, is an aspect that needs um, uh, a new toolbox uh, of probabilistic thinking, uh, lear learning, and how to look at computation as a form of ju judgment. And finally, the, like other questions that are relevant for AI safety, like reward, hacking, corrigibility, etc. We will not discuss all of these, so we will discuss just the three key aspects: so computation, judgment, information, learning, and probabilistic thinking. And in the end, we'll illustrate how they could be useful um, just by discussing privacy and fairness, which are uh, two important questions in algorithmic de decision-making. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, this, this is, uh, I think, a, a big program that we have in, in, in mind. And uh, uh, I think it's uh, very interesting. Like, uh, it's really an interesting insight that computer, computer science can give us into uh, what, what it means to, to provide a judgment, a good judgment, a reliable judgment, and uh, to command this with moral philosophy and stuff like this. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, maybe you can just clarify a bit by what we mean by uh, computational in, in general. Uh, but one, one important feature is like really this idea of uh, of step by step uh, reasoning, like very clear steps. And uh, also, if you uh, explain ahead of time what all these what the the steps are going to be, uh, then this can allow them to uh, analyze uh, the the step-by-step -step procedure, the algorithm that will be used, uh, and you can analyze them in, in many, many uh, respects. Uh, and uh, arguably also, um, well, th this is something that has been extremely popular in the history of mankind, and that really has changed a lot of the way we do a lot of things. Uh, so maybe you want to detail this. Let, let me a concrete case. It's like something people don't think of as a moral uh, issue. If you just type in a, search engine, COVID-19 vaccine. So what came first as a result of like what came in the first 10 pages of results, what to show you in the first 10 pages of results is, is, is a decision that is algorithmic, algorithmically made with a search engine ranking algorithm, but which entails enormous moral consequences because how you would nudge 3 billion people about resisting or accepting vaccines for COVID would have consequences on human life. So this is this is a moral question. This is a philosophical question. 
And it has a very short deadline, half a second, like a few milliseconds. Like the, the search engine should answer it in a few milliseconds. And, and we tend not to think, we tend to think of this as a technical question. Oh yeah, we just show what's most relevant or we just show what, what most people are discussing. Uh, is this really what we want to show people in, in the pandemic? Uh, for example, if there's a minority of people uh, initiating a conspiracy against vaccine, should we amplify it just because this minority of people are super, super active on the platform? Yeah, uh, and uh, also like, an interesting thing is that uh, when we raise these sort of, uh, of dilemmas, like I think a, a very common uh, reaction to all of this is to uh, uh, to say that these are if, if it's like a very difficult dilemma, like we tend to postpone the decision for this. We just say that like, it's a difficult dilemma and we need to be discussing this and uh, like, it's a good point that we cannot make a decision right now, but what we can do as of right now is try to think of how we're going to come up with a decision. Uh, just like saying, we'll have to discuss it. It's not really a, an algorithm that will uh, has the right properties of, of, of coming up with a, eventually a, a decision and a good decision if possible. When we have this dilemma, it is, it's important not just to leave the question open like this, but to, and it's also uh, important not to just take this decision like with our intuition, like right, right now, uh, but instead, like we should try to think of uh, a future step-by-step -step procedure, an algorithm, and propose different algorithms that will eventually make a decision because we need to eventually make a decision, especially for uh, times like uh, so results to search to search queries. Yeah, I think a, a good uh, illustrative example of that is uh, something we discussed previously uh, concerning uh, the multi-arm bandit problems and uh, clinical trials. So here we are in a case where uh, continuing as, uh, as, as algorithms are right now is an ethical problem because all these decisions by algorithms have ethical implications. And also the, the solution we implement to, to, to figure out uh, how to do better uh, will have to be uh, done. So we'll have to come up to a, to a satisfactory answer as quickly as possible while certainly making modification to these algorithms. So it's very important to correctly decide what procedure we implement to, uh, to reach uh, this, uh, this sort of ethical argument for social networks. Interestingly, uh, historically, this has been, uh, like for a long time, you could, you could imagine that this was difficult to, 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 to think about these things because um, like an algorithm has to be described at least and to be explained to one another. So like, I guess back in the old days, like it was more like transferred as transitions from one to another. But at some point, like uh, mankind invented uh, uh, writing uh, and the invention of writing completely revolutionized the game in the sense that people would be able to write down the algorithms to be followed. Uh, and these algorithms, uh, by now we call them the text of row. So they are not like, up, like very rigorous algorithms as the one you would tell your computer to, to execute. But they are like the beginning of this algorithmic approach to decision making, in particular to judgments uh, in the case of the law. Uh, where by having this algorithm written down, uh, you have several nice properties. Like one of them is that the, the same law can be applied to different settings. So you have the same law. So this is sometimes called the procedural fairness. You apply the same algorithm to different people. Uh, but you also have other properties, like for instance, now that the law is written, like the, the algorithm is written, you can analyze it, you can verify it. So you can say uh, to the judge, well, wait a minute, you did not judge me according to the algorithm. You can complain about this. You can also um, uh, improve upon it. You can say, oh yeah, the, the current version of the law has this flow that uh, this it makes this decision in this case, and uh, like most of people maybe think it's not good, so we can change the law, we can improve the algorithm. Uh, so th these are all uh, features of uh, of written laws uh, that and of algorithms that uh, have been a major breakthrough in the in the history of judgment. So maybe the takeaway message from this part is that if someone tells you they don't want to be judged by an algorithm. Ask them if they prefer to be judged by law or by the mood of a judge that does not tell them 
on which basis they judged. Like if the judge tells you like you are guilty because I think you are guilty, and if a judge tells you you are guilty because in the law of this country, if you put your car in front of the police station for more than three hours and then there is an accident in the police station, then you have to go to jail. So that this is an algorithm. If 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 then. Uh, you realize like most people prefer to be judged by an algorithm that is transparent, stated, public, that you can know in advance, ideally, or that you are assumed to know in advance. Uh, so actually, being judged by an algorithm is historically a progress <laughs> that we made thousands of years ago. So just like now, uh, maybe the problem is being judged by algorithms that are that you can't read, that are too too big for you to read and to audit and to assess. That's, yeah. the, that's the that's the real problem. It's not being judged by an algorithm. It's being judged by an intractable, by a non-readable, very long, complex algorithm. Yeah, and this is arguably already the case in, for the for the law as well. Yeah. Uh, like the tests of law have become uh, like they they are transparent in the sense that the text is uh, fully written somewhere, but they're not transparent in the sense that uh, it's very hard to interpret the law correctly. Uh, and also just because it's long, but also that because it uses uh, technical terms. And by the way, like even if you go to the this example we like to give thousands of years ago, in all cases you, you were judged by an algorithm. This algorithm is either either the if else. If you steal one cow, you have to pay the equivalent money of one cow. So this is a, this is an algorithm. And then there is the other algorithm which we call the mood mood of the crowd, the mood of the judge. It's not transparent. It is an algorithm. It is a decision-making process. It's very chaotic. You can't predict it. You can't anticipate it. So you always prefer the short, clear, transparent algorithm. If this, then this. If this, then this. So there's yeah. nothing, actually, there's nothing new. We, we always preferred transparent, clear, stated algorithms to obscure, chaotic, non-transparent algorithms. Yeah. Yeah, and also like sometimes uh, for certain algorithms you can uh, prove uh, properties. So, for instance, if you take uh, the the Gale Chaplet algorithm that's used to judge whether uh, a student will go to this university or this other university, uh, then uh, we know like mathematicians have been studying this algorithm, and we we know that uh, for instance it has some some nice properties. Uh, for instance, it's, uh, it leads to, to, to so-called uh, stable uh, matching. Uh, so I won't go into the details, I guess, but uh, essentially it has these nice properties, um, like incentive compatibility as well, if it's in the right way. Uh, and this can only be done if you have a, a known algorithm. Like it's, it's very hard to, to predict uh, the properties of the decision-making of, of the mood of the crowd or, of a, a singular human. Yeah. Uh, now, having said this, um, there's one limitation to to to, to the law, uh, which is the fact that uh, it has to be written by by humans, and uh, we humans are like are, are very smart and all, but we also are limited in our connection, and we we often have uh, trouble imagining cases. Uh, that have never occurred before in, in the past. Uh, and uh, also, like, the world is getting more and more complex, so it's getting harder and harder to, to design the, the right algorithm to judge any case in, in our societies. Uh, and that's where, uh, instead of just writing things down, we often rely uh, rather on the, the brain of a, of a judge than on, the, uh, than on the law as it is written. And uh, this has an explanation, again, in terms of com com computer, computer science, uh, in particular in terms of uh, what, we call, what is known as, uh, as the Solomonov uh, complexity, uh, sometimes also known as the Kolmogorov complexity, uh, which is, uh, well, it is defined as the, the shortest uh, algorithm in terms of like the description of the algorithm, so the, the shortest text of law that is able to do what we want to be doing. Uh, and uh, there are strong arguments, uh, like from, from Turing uh, in particular, that uh, there are many things that cannot be shortened. Like uh, there, there are probably a good text of law 
does not fit in a, a book of uh, two or three hundred pages. And maybe it does not even fit in uh, 1,000 book of uh, of uh, 1,000 pages uh, uh, because the world is just really, really complex in a very uh, meaningful sense. And in this case, we, we cannot have written laws that contain everything. We have to, to do something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was proposed by Turing in 1950 and it's the idea of doing learning. Uh, so instead of writing everything down, you're going to, to learn uh, through exper experience uh, what ought to be done. Uh, and, uh, and this also occurs in, in the case of the law and is uh, known as jurisprudence. And by the way, this occurred also in science and it's known as the scientific method. Like yeah. before, before the revolutionary idea that we call the scientific method started to be, of course it existed for at least 10 centuries, but it took off, it took off with the Galilean revolution, Kepler, Newton, and so on. And then we started inferring rules of nature from observations. And this is where, where, where human knowledge took off because it just scales more than having someone sitting down like a wise uh, philosopher and then stating the rules of the universe yeah doesn't scale yeah well yeah so, so the case of science is interesting because like you have uh like the so the, the text of law the text of the laws of the nature of nature I say, uh that have been written down more and more and we have improved these algorithms uh, as we as move but then we also went further we ask ourselves uh, how should the text of of uh, of the laws of nature be written like how should we come up with the right laws of nature mm. and uh, this led to uh, some sort of meta algorithm or well, they are still algorithms but the, they are learning algorithms mm. they are algorithms about how to, to 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 find out about the laws of nature uh, and this is also known as epistemology uh, uh, so that's why there's also a natural link here between computer science and uh, and, uh, mm. and especially learning theory and uh and epistemology uh, and philosophy learning is uh well it really took off uh, the bottleneck of, of learning was really uh to have a lot of data because you need a lot of data to do learning but you also need some a lot of computational power to to, to, to do the computations uh, of the learning algorithms uh and also you need like like a large memories and stuff like that in, in, in machines to, to do these, these things. Uh, but once we have all of these things, it turns out that learning is much more efficient than, uh, uh, well, you can do this in the human brain as well, but like learning is more, much more efficient than just writing down the, the text of laws because writing down by humans is just too hard. But it also comes with some disadvantages. Well, like you compare it to, to, to the empty set sometimes. So there's no algorithm that humans have written that's able to recognize a, a cat with 99% uh, accuracy, for instance. So when you're saying that the algorithm to recognize cats has some flaws, for instance, it's not as transparent, it's not really transparent. Well, you're actually comparing this to the empty set in a sense. So, uh, but still, they could say now we have these algorithms or, or these, uh, uh, judges that learned from past experiences what they should how they should judge in the future and these algorithms are now too complex to be studied uh, using the mathematical tools that we usually use for for small algorithms and so so it's harder like they are more black boxy they are, they are harder to to understand and this is a limitations but it's a limitation that's uh, inherent to learning and that's uh, like you cannot do without learning at least for some tasks uh, and, and like this creates just new challenges, uh, uh, yeah, and that needs to, to be to be faced. Uh, the the verification of of, of learning algorithms of l algorithms that have learned uh, is is much harder than of uh, algorithms that we designed to be uh, analyzed. Uh, maybe again here, I don't know if Louis wants to say something about the lear learning. Go ahead. Uh, no, no. I just wanted to conclude this part with like a, again a simple takeaway message if you if you're just like first uh, the first time exposed to these ideas is that like maybe the takeaway you should keep here is that 
hand programming rules does not scale. Like that's that's maybe the main key insight of Turing is that we could not sit down and start writing rules like if this do that, if this do that, if this do that, uh, and and produce a smart set of rules, a smart algorithm. So an algorithm is a set of rules. So what Turing realized is that if we want to speed up the programming of an intelligent algorithm, we need this algorithm to be adaptable. So it has like if this or this or this and this, and like those conditions are could be tweaked, could be modified, depending on what observations have been made. So modifying the conditions of the if and s in, uh, with respect to the observation. Like I observe that when I when I do this four times, I get the this result. But then I had a new experience where I only need to do it three times. So maybe this four, the parameter four, could be moved a bit down. And then I realized, no, no, 3.5 is on average better. So I, the algorithm needs to have some parameters that can be modified depending on the observations or the experiments. And Turing argued that this, this is faster, more efficient, and this is realistic. We can have a program within our lifetime that becomes intelligent in some, in some sense of intelligence, like realizing an objective, if we let it learn from data. And if we have, want to hand program it, it will take us a very, 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 very long time of writing rules. And this is more or less what happens. Like you, you take a task like image recognition. For four decades or five decades, people were trying to come up with handwritten rules. OK, if there is a polygon like this, and then you look at the shape, and this is the nose, etc. then this is a male. And if the polygon is like that, and the nose is like this, and the mouth, and I don't know the ratio between, I'm just like making up, then it is probably a woman. And this, this did, not, did, did not work. But if we feed an algorithm many data points and let the algorithm like have, have a, what we call a learning algorithm so that it can change the parameters, now we achieved, of course, we're not yet there, but we have, for example, algorithms in Facebook that recognize faces, and they recognize that this is Louis, and this is uh, uh, Katrina, uh, uh, and this is uh, etc. And, and, and those algorithms, clearly, we could not have obtained them by handwriting if this do that, if this do that. But then we just let them learn from data. And, and, and this idea is very old. It's from 1950. It was stated by Alan Turing. And, and, and it is the key idea behind learning. Le learning just scales better than programming. So if we want to write algorithms, if we want to write laws, we need to complement programming by learning. And sometimes we, sometimes we mainly need learning. And arguably, in the context of law, it happened also. We call this jurisp jurisprudence, I think in English also, jurisprudence in French where like, you observe cases and you make up rules based on cases that pleased everyone, so, so to say. We observe that when, when we punish uh, a killer with this punishment, there is no riot. They like, everyone is happy with this punishment, or almost everyone. When we punish the killer with this punishment, people are not satisfied. The family of the victim are not satisfied. Clearly, this law needs to change. So this is a learning process. Writing law itself is a learning process. And this is, again, another point where law and algorithmics meet, just like they met initially uh, thousands of years ago. Another point uh, I'm thinking of uh, would correspond more to the, 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 the first section of the, the podcast, but uh, is that uh, no. Uh, I'll give you two ways to, to think about the the, the the way we write laws. Uh, this is a discussion I've, I've had with uh, uh, Gilles Dweck, who, who told me uh, this, which I found very interesting. Like, essentially, you can think of the law as either an algorithm, that's what we've been discussing uh, right, right so far. Another way that people sometimes feel like writing the law is as specifications, like, uh, uh, this must happen, this must happen, this must happen. This, this is not an algorithm. Like This is just the things that you want your decision to satisfy. And uh, the, 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 the annoying thing with, with specifications, well, the, the, the good thing is that it's 
arguably easier to write specifications. Like you can just say, oh yeah, this should be like this. But the the trouble with the specifications is that uh, well, sometimes the the set of specifications describe an empty set, uh, uh, meaning that uh, all the specifications want to put you, you want the law to satisfy uh, means that there's no decision that can satisfy all of these decisions, uh, and that's why yeah, I think it's it's at least interesting to to not just stop at specifications which arguably is a lot of what uh, people are doing when they discuss uh, guidelines for, for AI, for ethical AI concerns. They will just they will say that the good AI needs to satisfy this, 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 and this. And I think it's useful, but uh, it, it can only be seen as a first step because uh, like eventually I think we, we, we need an algorithm to know what should be decided and not just like what the, the, the specifications are. Yeah, it's something I found interesting. Also, like if you have an algorithm, you can also analyze like uh, other things, like for instance, it's uh, computation time, because uh, we we know from uh, from like in Turing, from Turing's uh, uh, halting problem that uh, uh, like just determining if there is a solution to a set of specifications, uh, or if there is a, exists a, a decision X as such that this and this and this, this is a, a statement, it's a, it's a conjecture. And we know from Turing that uh, determining if this conjecture is true or not, or has a proof or not, is uh, is undecidable in general, so meaning that there's no algorithm that achieves this all the time. So that's another argument for why we should think in terms of algorithms rather than uh, just specifications. The, the third point we need to discuss is uh, well, probabilistic thinking, which is clearly critical in the case of, of the court of law, um, even though it's been uh, for, for, forbidden in the, the UK uh, after some... Uh, well, the, 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 thing, the problem is that a lot of people, are, including myself, are, are very hard, have a very hard time thinking probabilistically, so it is just very, very hard. Uh, but arguably it's also very critical. Uh, so the way sometimes things are phrased in the context of law and of science is people would talk about proofs. Uh, and uh, if you think about this, uh, well, proofs are only well defined in, in mathematics. Uh, uh, but in the context of, uh, of science or in the context of law, what we have is more evidence. Like we have data, essentially. And based on this data, we can infer, we do the, the learning from this data, we infer what is more likely to have occurred or not. Mm. Um, but you never get to, to any point of certainty uh, because it's always possible that there's some like explanation that we have not thought about that's much more complicated. And, and actually these uh, more complicated or unforeseen uh, explanations are arguably quite, uh, frequent in the, in the case of the law. So you need to take into account this uncertainty and you need to reason with uncertainty to, to come up with, with decision. So instead of saying, if the person is guilty, then we should do this. And, and saying, uh, if the person is innocent, then we should do this, which sounds very good. But in practice, you, you never get to this state. Like you should think in terms of like, well, given how likely it is that he has done this and this, what should be uh, decided for this person? Uh, this would be much more probabilistic thinking, and you might think it's very weird in the text in context of, of law. But yeah, sometimes you just don't have enough data, uh, and it becomes even more critical in, in, in for many uh, problems, uh, for instance, uh, that involve a lot of uncertainty. For instance, for the COVID situation. So, what should be answered when you when someone is searching COVID vaccine, COVID nineteen vaccine, on, on Google, for instance? This is a very very complicated. Uh, question because also we don't know uh, so far like how long it's going to take to have effective vaccine, how dangerous the vaccines are going to be, uh, how, are they going to be uh, producible at, at scale? There are lots of open questions, and what you're going to reply today to these questions is very important to, to prepare the, the population for, for what's coming next. And so, you need to make a decision right now despite the huge uncertainty on what's going to, to come uh, around like in, in the next month. Yeah, one example for this, for example, was the one of the latest study on uh, hydroxychloroquine 
that was uh, retracted uh, a few weeks after. So because there is a possibility that when you see a study, it, it was actually not the high quality information that you expected, but sometimes quite often it is actually the, the high quality information that you expect. But uh, basing a decision based on, the, on, this, on this kind of uh, evidence, which uh, as they say, is not a, a clear proof that, is, that, that will tell you 100% uh, what is the behavior to adopt. So you should treat this as an evidence knowing the possibility that it was actually uh, there was actually mistakes on the on the on the process of creation of this uh, evidence, and uh, that's why also uh, a much stronger evidence that we should look at is things like meta analysis or the, the global context in which uh, the whole science is produced. And uh, without this uh, probabilistic thinking in mind, then we get into a mistake either being absolutely convinced that the uh, authors of this study are, are, are trying to manipulate uh, the, the result due to conflict of interest or being uh, in, on the other side fully convinced that uh, the, the hydroxychloroquine uh, treatment is absolutely bullshit. So there's, there should not be any, any uh, we should not be at any end of these uh, extremes. Like we should consider every piece of evidence as uh, something that moves slightly our probability estimate of, of, of what are right decisions to take uh, given the situation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, work and it's very hard to be fair, but it, it, we need to improve this. Like it's really critical for better uh, decision making to improve in terms of probabilis probabilistic uh, thinking and particular estimating more correctly the probabilities of, of different events. And then there's the, the, there's this other side of of probabilistic thinking, which is now that you have this uncertainty, what what should you what should you do? And one thing that uh, is very hard, but you this should really, this should really be done is to not reflect only in terms of the most likely scenario. Like it's very tempting to say, well, I believe this, and to forget that. It, you it doesn't mean that you fully believe it, and there may be like a five percent chance that uh, the alternative scenario occurs. And, and this is particularly critical in the cases in the case of uh, of pandemics, for instance, because if you were back in February or in January, let's say um, 2020, for those who watch this uh, long time in the future, uh, then there were different scenarios, and maybe you could imagine that the more likely scenario for the COVID-19 uh, outbreak, but then not yet a pandemic, was that uh, it would not be uh, a pandemic. Uh, and maybe uh, right now you could say that uh, maybe in, 20, in 2021, uh, there's uh, like probably the most likely scenario is that uh, there's not going to be a, a, a pandemic uh, of another virus, of another disease that's much worse than the COVID-19. That's the most likely scenario. Mm -hmm. But we should not think in terms only of the most likely scenario, and we should prepare for the possibility that things go bad. And particularly, we should prepare for this if the probability of this thing going very bad is not too small. Uh, if it's one person, arguably, of something extremely bad, it's it's already huge. But if it's like uh, ten to the minus twenty, well, it's negligible. Uh, and, and there's a big difference between 10 to the minus 20 and, and, and 1 percent. But it's very hard for us humans like, to, to make this distinction because we tend to, to, to confuse, like, to, to, to consider that these two are just unlikely scenarios. Yeah, maybe, maybe to illustrate the difference, uh, if something that has 1 percent chance to happen every year out of uh, 1,000 years, it will nearly happen for sure. But something that has 10 to the minus 20 chance to happen every year out of 1,000 years, it will nearly not happen for sure. Yeah. It nearly for sure not. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so the decision making has to take this into account. And uh, some, uh, sometimes known as the safety mindset, like, like trying to make sure that you compute it to the probabilities of very, very bad scenarios. And uh, if this probability is uh, not that small, then you should prepare at least a, a plan for if it occurs, and maybe even uh, plans to, to reduce this probability. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe also 
So one thing about um, probabilistic thinking that is really overlooked, including of people who work in probabilities. So the same thing we keep saying about us, people working in computer science, we neglect how, how epistemologically deep uh, concepts we have in computer science uh, can be and can be applied outside computer science. For example, I, I would recommend the book um, of Brian Christian and Tom Griffith's um, uh, Algorithms to Live By, which illustrates this fact. Actually, for probabilistic thinking to live by, there is a 200 years old book written by Simon, uh, Simon Laplace, um, which is called uh, Essay Philosophique sur les probabilités, uh, like a philosophical essay on, on probabilities. And it, it, it's like in some chapters, you could, you could see the, the premise, like the, the preliminary version of, for example, a lot of the work that has been done in the 20th century about co cognitive biases, for example. And it, it's Laplace called, like today we call them cognitive biases. Laplace calls them illusions in estimating probabilities. And he illustrates that with, uh, with Leibniz, for example, uh, being biased towards what is common and what is familiar to him and what has been told to him in his childhood and, and trying to see it in phenomena that has nothing to do with the, like, he, like Leibniz once wrote to the Chinese emperor because the Chinese emperor liked maths uh, and, and tried to convince him of Christianity using a phenomenon in, 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 uh, in, in series, like uh, uh, sums of series by telling him, look at like, you can have one out of zeros and this is creation. Just and then, and then and then Laplace goes on more brilliantly than what I just have said, like I'm probably uh, not reflecting how, how, how clear the statement of Laplace was, just like showing like how much when we're like used to something and exposed to something during our childhood or during our life, we tend to be biased for it, for confirming it and seeing it everywhere we look. Uh, you, he could also like his, and then uh, and then also like he's he's giving examples uh, like for example uh, he's given the example of slavery and castes in India as something like people normalize because it's common and then he goes on to expose why frequency commonality are are not valid epistemic arguments so if something is frequent or if something is common that doesn't mean it is okay uh, either morally or epistemic like, it's like commonality is not valid epistemic as an epistemic argument or as a moral argument. And of course, he also does a lot of connections with moral philosophy. And unfortunately, this work is really overlooked like, uh, by, by people who work in politics. I was never taught this course. I uh, discovered it uh, 10 years after my, like more than 10 years now, 12 years after my undergraduate study politics. Yeah, maybe I'm not going to make a lot of friends by saying this, but uh, I think this is the best book in philosophy ever written. <laughs> It's really, really fantastic. Like I, I really uh, highly, highly uh, recommend it. And I, I just want to say to, to quote, uh, uh, well, let me two two sentences. I was going to say one, but I'm going to quote two uh, sentences from, from this uh, book. Uh, the first one is um, the theory of probabilities is basically just good sense reduced to computation. Oh, wait. Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's fantastic quality. It's like it's it's a very bold claim if you think good about judgment. it. Like like here, like more good judgment than good sense or common sense. Yeah, maybe good judgment. Judgment. Right. Yeah. yeah. Translate it into common sense. I translate it into, into good sense. Yeah. Right. So, or good judgment. Yeah. Yeah, good judgment maybe is better, but yeah, it's a matter of translation. But yeah, I think this quote is like really, really, like it's really, really bold. Like uh, I think it's. And I think it's very, very uh, accurate. Uh, I think it's like very uh, a lot of food for thought, and it's really also uh, aligned with what we've been saying. Like it's uh, computation. If you can reduce things to computation, you, you've done like ninety nine point ninety nine percent of the job in a sense. Well, it's still hard to reduce it to, to effective computation. I, uh, then I guess, but it's it's uh, it's really really important. Like this book and the theory of probabilities and his insight. And like just like the the other quote I wanted to 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 give is that uh, there is no science, or other than the science of probabilities, more worthy of our meditations and whose results are more useful. Uh, yeah, he says better what I what I think. <laughs> so.
so maybe uh, just to conclude, uh, we'll illustrate all of what has been said now with the, well, of course, like we'll be superficially discussing fairness and privacy. Those are very, very, very complex uh, problems. Uh, like, uh, and uh, unfortunately, some researchers tend to see them as like, uh, just like we can just tackle them with some solution and then and then they are solved. They're like, if privacy and fairness are not uh, as tractable as, uh, I don't know, let's say, uh, Convec proving convexity of a loss function, <laughs> like uh, like yeah, people, like sometimes we, we well, like those are very very complex topics. So we, we obviously we're not we're not broadly discussing them or just like superficially discussing them, just like through a narrow angle, which is how probabilistic thinking helped us in the past decade improve the way we think about privacy and fairness. So maybe we can start by differential privacy, which is maybe more mature now, 10 years old, or more than 10 years, like 12 years old at least. And then we can move to fairness, which is even more, even younger. And, and, and but, but, but it builds upon some of the reasoning that has been, doing, been made in differential privacy. So I don't know if you want to go with that, Louis or you know, Lulé. Yes, the idea of uh, differential privacy is that uh, when some of your data is, uh, or it's going to be like uh, instead of releasing your data, you're releasing some noisy version of the data, uh, such that uh, any observer would be uh, like unable to infer with high probability uh, what your what your true data were. Well, it's not exactly that, but it's more. It has more to do with uh, how much he can change his beliefs, like how how can how much he can update his beliefs by having seen. Uh, the data that you are, are releasing. So that, that would be like the probabilistic uh, interpretation of, of the concept called uh, differential privacy, which has been the leading, one of the leading uh, concepts for, for privacy uh, over the last 15 years. The other one being uh, this concept, of, well, the other big line of thoughts in terms of uh, privacy being this uh, complexity related, like you, you, you cipher your message such that no, Observer that has a limited computational power can decide can can, can learn anything from your from your, your message. Yeah. So what's important to see here uh, is the how actually probability is come up into a correctly uh, this this very interesting definition of uh, of privacy. And and, and not only uh, as we were discussing previously uh, a binary definition of uh, private or not private, but something that is as much private as possible by uh, by showing as few as possible bits of information about yourself. Bits of information meaning uh, how does someone change what he thinks of me based on the data he has seen uh, coming from me. And the less bits of information, the less someone is able to update uh, the probabilities of what he thinks about me. Yeah. Yeah, it's also interesting because uh, you can then think in terms of trade-offs. Um, and there's a, a lot of research about like Okay. If all data remains private in, in differential privacy terms, uh, then uh, well, you cannot learn anything from from the population, and this can be a problem. Like, for instance, in the case of, uh, of the pandemic, you do want to to, to know like things like uh, what is the the fraction of the population that currently has the COVID nineteen. This is really important information to have uh, to to know whether you should do lockdown or whatever. Uh, but uh, this information for, for individuals, for every individual, can be also a cause of concern for this individual. So you, you you want to learn, but not too much about your population, in a sense. And uh, differential privacy uh, uh, gives you a way to 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 write down this trade-off and to compute uh, depending on how much you care on on controlling the pandemic and uh, avoiding deaths and how much you care about privacy uh, and surveillance. Uh, but yeah, you have a natural framework to, to do the, to choose your trade-off. Yeah, it is a, an additional argument against uh, simply having list of specifications for algorithms. Yeah. And uh, so for example, if you have two specification, like the algorithm should avoid death and the algorithm should uh, remain uh, private then what happens when some specific decisions uh, can avoid death 
but by uh, being uh, intruding uh, towards privacy, should we take these kind of decisions that don't fit one specification but uh, are imposed by the by the first specification? And uh, and the, the right answer to this, uh, I believe, is to to think of it in terms of trade-offs. So somehow having an estimation of how how important it is to to avoid death, how important it is to uh, to avoid. Uh, Privacy and it's great to have a, a measure of how much actually are we invading privacy uh, with this uh, differential privacy uh, definition to to allow to to take decision in a proper way uh, when facing these kind of dilemmas. So what's interesting also in terms of fairness is that uh, so well the, the basic idea of fairness is typically you'd want them uh, to 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 very to to guarantee that for two uh, different uh, subpopulations. Uh, like some, uh, well, for instance, the same uh, rate of uh, of uh, job offers is, is is done. So the probability of the, of having a job of receiving a job offer, for instance, given that you're from this population or given that you're from this other population, maybe should not be too too different. So this is called the uh, uh, group fairness. So you comparing the fairness between two groups. Um, and there's another idea of fairness which you can think of, which is uh, individual fairness, which essentially means that you are treated uh, given all your data. So you, like, uh, uh, every feature of you is, is rightfully uh, taken into account. Um, and so this would be more about uh, your probability of getting your job given your 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 what well, what is known about you, what is publicly known about you, for instance. And it turns out that, and you may say, yeah, yeah, like every individual should be judged based on on his uh, competence, for instance. And you say, we also like uh, there should be no uh, discrimination between like uh, different groups. So you want may want you may want both individual fairness and group fairness. So there will be a, a specification approach. And it turns out that uh, you can prove mathematically that in many cases, or in most cases, uh, uh, these two are incompatible. So the so the specification approach to fairness would be, uh, uh, well, like you cannot have all uh, all versions of fairness at least uh, simultaneously. Uh, so so then you need to to, to specify this more, uh, and uh, and again like to to compute the trade-offs and, and what we really mean uh, uh, by, by fairness. The the language of probability uh, turns out to be very 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 relevant. I, I had like a few things to add, but um, I think like just like maybe the takeaway from this part is that um, it's, like again we like very superficially uh, tackled uh, yeah. especially fairness because it's it's uh, people are just realizing that 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 it is a scientific question. Okay, so, so of course it is a socially very important question. Um, it's also that it it. Which is a very highly scientific question that could be tackled with the um, with the scientific method. Uh, maybe the, just like a, as a side note, sometimes we still like uh, in some communities uh, the topic is not as highly regarded and uh, as I don't know proving some conversion speed of uh, stochastic gradient descent on a convex loss function. And I believe this is this is not the, the, this is um, this is something that that is not okay. Uh, for example, in the machine learning community, to like disregard research in fairness as non-technical, actually, it's a first of all, it's a very highly technical question. And if we go back to the beginning of the podcast, uh, algorithms, uh, like the, the the researcher that gave us the name algorithms, was actually trying to improve law. Like he, he was a lawyer, and he was trying to make law more rigorous more transparent and this is how we invented algebra and algorithms by trying to by trying to improve law so working on fairness is extremely relevant for computer science and it's extremely uh, it's an extremely interesting research topic so just like if there are like grad students watching this podcast please don't disregard this topic it's like you shouldn't like um, it's not like just like about like please don't do it like if you are doing it you're wrong like if you are doing it you are really disregarding a research question that is highly technical, highly subtle, highly complex, and uh, unfortunately, seen like very respected researchers disregard the topic, and that that's not that's a bit sad and, and, and unfortunate. Um, I hope like now it's just a generational problem. The young, uh, 
personally, I didn't experience that with your younger researchers, mostly. The old generation of computer scientists didn't didn't, didn't question, uh, didn't uh, look at these questions as, as maybe what's happening today. So maybe it's just a generational problem that is going to improve itself with time. Uh, there is a very good book um, written by Aaron Roth and Michael Kearns. Um, if my memory is good, Aaron Roth was a PhD student of Cynthia Dvork. Cynthia Dvork is the researcher to which uh, we owe um, differential privacy. So Aaron Roth also worked on differential privacy. And um, Aaron Roth, like, she, she, she did, uh, so Cynthia Dvork did uh, a lot of very relevant research, like she has a very broad portfolio of questions that she tackles. She worked in distributed computing initially, theoretical computer science, but she also gave us the formalism of differential privacy. And now with uh, researchers like Aaron Roth um, and others, uh, a lot of there is now a growing community around the Fairness, Accountability and Transparency Conference uh, by ACN. Um, we could list, we could go on with a big list of research like, uh, um, uh, you just like go to the conference and look at the proceedings. Uh, I don't want to name a few and not name the others, but um, uh, this this is this is obviously like this is a question where probabilistic thinking is is very helpful. If you look at the statement of differential privacy, it is a, stiff, a probabilistic statement. So uh, I think we have a video on uh, like at least there is a zettabyte video on. Uh, on, on differential privacy, you could you could look it up, uh, and the same now applies for fairness. It's it's not something you define in a binary way or in a formally. Uh, it's like it's, it's like it's not it's not something you can do with first order logic. It's something where probabilities are not a luxury, are a necessity. So with that, I, I think uh, we can just wrap up and uh, cool. So we see you uh, next time. Yeah. Bye.